Welcome to the MOOC's course Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Rubber Industry Part 2. First we have a recapitulation of what we have discussed in the previous lecture of this particular chapter on rubber industry. We started discussions on uh, basics of rubber industry where we started uh, contrasting natural versus synthetic uh, rubbers. Synthetic rubbers may be taken as elastomers which are produced by elastomer polymerization processes. Then uh, importance of uh, natural versus synthetic rubbers we have seen and then also production point of view also we have seen. For example, in Indian uh, conditions or for India most of the rubber needs are being fulfilled by the natural uh, rubbers. In fact, up to 65 to 70 percent of uh, Indian rubber needs are fulfilled by the natural rubbers whereas for the uh, USA it is opposite only 30 percent of their uh, uh, rubber requirements are fulfilled by the natural rubbers whereas the remainings are fulfilled by the synthetic rubber especially after the development of a SBR that is butadiene styrene copolymer such uh, basics also we have seen from the applications point of view as well as the importance point of view. Then we have discussed uh, ASTM abbreviations provided to different types of uh, rubbers. Okay. Pertinent properties of uh, rubber polymers we have seen rather uh, pertinent properties uh, you know quantitatively discussing uh, we have given a list of properties which one should uh, go through before uh, making a finalization about the applications of a, a given type of rubber that has been produced or otherwise before producing a rubber what are the properties you need to uh, concentrate in the final product that you can take as a checklist and then appropriately you can decide on the uh, monomers and then uh, polymerization conditions and all that. Okay. So, there we have given the list only, we did not give the quantitative values of the properties because one rubber to the other rubber is going to be very different. Then additional processes such as compounding while making the uh, final product mixing and vulcanization and final forming of the final product that is obtained by the uh, rubber polymers have also been discussed in the previous lecture. And then we concluded our uh, previous lecture on uh, rubber industry by discussing the manufacturing of uh, SBR that is butadiene styrene copolymer. Okay. Now in this lecture we will be discussing about uh, polymeric oils and rubbers based on silicons. What do you mean by polymeric oils? These are nothing but uh, synthetic lubricants. right? of a polymeric composition. Okay. However, the other synonym for such kind of polymeric oils or synthetic lubricants is silicons. Okay. These are also known as the silicons. Okay. So, that is use of synthetic lubricants of a polymeric composition is synonymous with uh, silicons. Okay. So, these polymeric oils are nothing but in general we can call them as a synthetic uh, lubricants they are having polymeric compositions right and then most of these uh, uh, lubricants are based on the silica right silicon polymers have found use as high temperature rubbers and resin coatings in general okay so these silicon polymers are usually in uh, uh, liquid conditions they are uh, you know uh, considered as uh, fluid polymers okay their unusual physical properties as fluid polymers account for much of the marketing efforts in silicon polymers. Right? So, they are having a lot of applications in high temperature rubbers because these are very stable uh, with respect to the temperature, highly stable with respect to the temperature. That is the reason these silicon polymers or polymeric oils based on the silicon you know, you know they are very stable with respect to the temperature that is the reason they are used as high temperature rubbers and then resin coatings wherever the, the applied temperature may be sufficiently high enough. Okay. So, because of these unusual properties as fluid uh, polymers, you know much of the marketing efforts uh, in silicon polymers have been diverted towards production of such kind of uh, fluid polymers. Okay. Silicons differ structurally from other polymers as well. Now, you realize almost by now that is silicons is a synonyms to uh, synthetic lubricants of polymeric composition and then those polymers are based on the uh, silicon component. right? So, most of the previous polymers whatever we have uh, 
discussed in the polymer industry as well as the previous lecture of uh, rubber industry, they are based on the carbon. Whereas uh, these polymers, uh, you know, these are based on the silicon and they are synthetic lubricants having polymeric composition. Right? So, these silicons differ structurally from other polymers as well, okay? how that we are going to see by structures anyway. In that structure, main chain is a recurring sequence of tetravalent silicon and an oxygen atoms with varying properties. So, whatever the free uh, silicons that are available, how they are being connected to the other monomers or the other similar monomer if not the different one, accordingly the properties of the final material are, is going to change. Such variations in the properties depend on group of substitutions on two free silicon bonds. Right. So, the same thing we see by uh, structure wise also, if you see the basic chemistry of this material, if you produce this uh, linear silicon polymers or uh, linear silicons, here this SI actually you know connected with some kind of uh, alkyl or aryl groups in general like this. So, SI is also having 4 bonds, so these bonds now they are uh, you know, you know occupied by the alkyl groups, aryl groups along with the oxygen atoms. So, these uh, two bonds of uh, each SI atom are free, how are they going to be connected with the oxygen atom or other substitutions based on that one the properties are going to vary. So, if you have this linear silicons, uh, then this is the structure that you get. But if you try to produce cross-linked silicon polymer or cross-linked silicons, then the same structure this SI connected with R prime, R prime and then O. So, that is connected with other SI, R prime and then O. So, this now this is this SI is connected to another SI, R prime and then R prime. So, now this in between that O is whatever is there, how it is connected to the the, uh, the other one, other monomer based on that one you can get uh, either branched or fully cross linked to silicon. So, now here this O is connected to the SI and then like this you can have a cross linked silicon polymer. Okay? So, this is the important thing actually you know tetravalent silicon out of which you know two bonds are usually uh, occupied by the oxygen and then alkyl or aryl group. So, the remaining one how are being substituted with the other monomers or other functional. So, accordingly the structure would be developed. So, theoretically that is what pictorially that you understand, but doing experimentally this you know one has to be very uh, sure about the temperature, pressure and then time of the operations to get the desired properties in the final silicons. The comparison of uh, carbon and uh, silicon bonds have been found or shows that silicon oxygen bond is much stronger than silicon silicon or silicon carbon bonds in contrast to CC bonds in hydrocarbons. In hydrocarbons whatever CC bonds are there in contrast to that one if you come make a comparison SiO bonds are much stronger than SI SI bonds or SI C bonds. Okay? So, this information how it is going to be useful? If you wanted to make a particular bond breaking and then add other substitutions, so then this information is going to be very useful. Accordingly, you can target certain bonds which can be cleaved easily and then uh, do the re, uh, you know required substitutions. Silicon forms much larger rings than 5 to 6 membered carbon rings. Okay? So, much larger rings are formed by the uh, silicons. Therefore, cyclization competes more readily with chain polymerization than encountered in carbon polymer chemistry. So, we are going to see the chemistry also uh, subsequently in the subsequent slides, you know where uh, whatever the intermediates that are produced, you know monomer intermediates are produced, they are highly active, they are highly active that they immediately undergo polymerization to form silicons, whereas that is not that much easy, such kind of polymerization is not that much easy in the case of a carbon polymer uh, formations or polymers based on the carbon whatever we have seen that is not that much easy in case of a carbon polymers. Starting monomers are usually alkyl or aryl halosilanes which undergo hydrolysis of halogen atoms to produce reactive siloxane intermediates. These siloxane intermediates are very reactive, highly reactive 
So, what happens immediately they undergo uh, you know polymerization. So, whatever the intermediate siloxanes are formed they are very active very highly active. So, immediately they undergo polymerization and then they form uh, silicons they form silicons ok. So, uh, we are going to see with the reactions also, but uh, when we discuss polymerization or other types of rubbers uh, without silicon where the carbon is the main material or main atom to uh, in undergoing the polymerization. So, carbon based polymerations does not take place so much easily whereas, silicon based polymerization takes place easily immediately because the intermediate monomers are very very reactive. Unstable siloxanes condense almost instantaneously to polymer that is they will undergo condensation polymer immediately to produce polymer. So, that initial hydrolysis step whatever is there or uh, this first step where hydrolysis is taking place to produce siloxane that is the rate controlling step because that is you know slow process whereas, the uh, production of silicons from the unstable siloxanes is instantaneous. So, that cannot be rate controlling step. So, first step is hydrolysis to uh, siloxane. So, that reaction we see generalized reactions we are going to see this R can be alkyl or aryl group R A stands for some kind of number and then Si silicon X stands for halogens B some kind of number that is like functionality it gives about the functionality if it is 2 it is a bifunctional ok plus B H O H that is hydrolysis it is undergoing right. So, then what you get you get R A S I O H B which is nothing but siloxane intermediate and then which is unstable highly reactive which undergoes polymerization immediately. And then it also releases H X let us say X is C L then H C L you will be getting here ok. Now, the A and B also there is a relation right the functionality the A and then B whatever are there. So, the there is a relation the summation of uh, these two is 4 the reaction this reaction is a generalized one. So, in the generalized reaction we have A and B like this. So, but wherever you take if A is 1 then B has to be 3 if B is 2 then A should also be 2 like that. So, A plus B is equals to 4 and then B denotes the degree of functionality of the monomer whether it is monofunctional or bifunctional or trifunctional as we have seen in the uh, polymers industry chapter ok. Let us say if B is 2 then A is also 2 then what it would be R2 Si OH2 siloxane that would be undergoing condensation reaction immediately that is n moles of R2 Si OH twice undergoing uh, polymerization to give R2 Si O n polymer this is silicon actually right. So, and then also releasing n moles of H2O because it is a condensation reaction ok condensation polymer is taking place immediately right. So, but now you have to have a provision to stop the reaction also how to stop. So, there are different provisions are possible one of the important provision is that chain length can be controlled by adding small amounts of monofunctional trialkyl or aryl monomers which can off the chain ends and impart chemical stability by adding such kind of monomers also you can do you can stop the you know polymer uh, continuation reaction ok. It has to be stopped somewhere right as per the requirement. So, if you add uh, monofunctional trialkyl or uh, triaryl monomer. So, this is what this one this is that particular uh, component ok. Now, this is being added to the siloxane. So, this is the generalized representation of the siloxane. So, to this siloxane you add this monomer. So, then reaction would stop and then you will get this particular structure ok. So, here R whatever is there that can be alkyl or aryl group. Physical properties and uses of uh, silicons if you see methyl silicon polymers of the linear type produce oils 
with a low rate of change of viscosity at low temperatures with fluidity down to minus 85 degree centigrade. You can see even at minus 85 degree centigrade, it is having you know uh, low rate of change of viscosity. There is no much change in the viscosity, almost negligible change in the viscosity whatever is there at the room temperature. Right, so on almost that much viscosity is there. It is not uh, changing much, even if you change the temperature of the storing or flowing conditions of the temperature. If you change it to minus 85 degrees centigrade, so such are the stable these silicon oils. That's the reason they have very good market. Okay, so we talk about only methyl silicon about uh, this uh, specific uh, example, but almost it is true that is thermal stability is very high for almost all silicon polymers. These oils are in general non-volatile, obviously if they are so much stable with respect to temperature that means they are non-volatile. In addition to that one they are also non-toxic and an extremely stable, extremely stable with no sludging or oxidation even up to 150 degree centigrade. So, because of such reasons. Uh, most of the laboratory experiments at, uh, especially where you need to conduct the uh, reaction at uh, 100 to 150 degrees centigrade, right? So, what you use? You use the oil baths, oil baths you in general use and then you heat this oil bath to certain temperature whatever 100 to 150 degrees centigrade temperature you wanted to do and then in this oil bath you uh, keep your beaker or conical flax in which you are doing the reaction. The reason is that even at this such high temperature, the sludging of uh, silicon oils does not take place or oxidation of silicon oils does not take place, it is stable, it is not going to be lost, it is non-volatile. So, because of that reason in most of the chemical engineering laboratories or chemistry laboratories wherever these kind of heating requirements are there, silicon oil baths are used. However, there is a disadvantage with this one that is the high cost. Because of this high cost, the application of uh, silicon oils to special applications only it is you know uh, restricted, right. So, uh, their high cost limits uses to special applications such as gauge fluids and dashboard liquids as for such kind of important uh, uh, applications only these are used because they are highly costly. That is the one disadvantage. Silicon fluids make excellent liquid dielectrics because of their low power loss, low water absorption and then heat stability as already mentioned. Okay? Because of uh, these three important uh, characteristics that is low power loss, low water absorption and then uh, high heat uh, stability, these silicon oils or silicon fluids are used as a liquid dielectrics in general. By additional polymerization and compounding with uh, thickening agents, various types of stable greases are also produced. So many greases are also produced from these silicon oils, but however, you have to use appropriate compounding fillers, activators, plasticizers, etc. These are the compounding agents. So, they should be added so that to make these silicon oils thick enough and then uh, once they become thicker, they can be used as stable greases. Whereas, these greases have high working range, see minus 75 to 260 degree centigrade, they are stable, these greases whatever that you produce, right. So, because of such high uh, thermal stability, these uh, greases are often used, right. Now, this temperature range is much wider compared to the uh, greases that are produced from the petroleum grade. Okay. So, that means indirectly compared to the petroleum grade uh, greases, greases obtained by the thickening of uh, silicon fluids or silicon oils are better ones because they are stable to a very wider range of temperatures minus 75 to plus 260 degree centigrade. Now, coming to the methods of production. The conventional process was uh, silicon monomers were first prepared by a Grignard method in which alkyl was substituted step by step for chlorine in SiCl4. That is uh, you have a SiCl4 like this, 
now you react with some kind of uh, alkyls so that this uh, one of this uh, uh, Cl is being replaced by let us say for example alkyl or CH3. This is done at once. Now to replace the other one say the next uh, uh, again alkylation uh, reaction you have to do to replace the other uh, Cl with the second CH3 group. So, like that stepwise reaction is taking place and then because of this stepwise reaction the cost of you know production of silicon monomers increases because of such reasons this kind of method is not used nowadays. Because of such kind of stepwise reaction this process is quite expensive and has been dropped in favor of direct method starting with silicon metal and alkyl or aryl chlorides that is what we are going to discuss uh, by uh, flow chart as well. So, process description silicon metal of low purity having 98 to 99 percent see in the case of silicon you can produce up to 99.99 percent purity as well that uh, we have seen in the our previous course in organic chemical technology right. So, but you know if you have 98 percent silicon metal then also it is considered as a low purity. So, low purity silicon metal like 98 to 99 percent purity is crushed and milled to a powder. This powder is then mixed with Cu copper copper oxide catalyst and charged batch wise to methylating tower reactor. To this methylating tower reactor you are supplying methyl chloride actually. So, that methylation of silicon metal takes place and then you get the monomers. Okay. Those monomers you purify and then do the polymerization to get the silicon oils that is the you know in the nutshell the process to get the silicon oils, but we see all the details with flow chart as well. Usually these methylating tower reactors are 4.5 meters high and 0.6 meters, uh, 0.6 meters diameter fitted with a vertical screw conveyor stirrer constructed of carbon steel and jacketed for Dautem heat control at about 300 degrees centigrade. So, you wanted to control the temperature at around 300 degrees centigrade within the methylating tower reactor. So, the reactor is provided with the jackets for Dautem heat control as well. Okay. So, Dauthems are you know some kind of uh, heat transfer fluids when you circulate them. So, the temperature would be controlled. Okay. Methyl chloride vapor is fed to the bottom of the tower to produce an exothermic reaction. That reaction is like methyl chloride, 2 moles of methyl chloride is reacting with the silicon to give dimethyl chloro or dimethyl dichloro silane. Okay. Otherwise, 6 moles of uh, methyl chloride reacting with silicon to give trimethyl chloro silane okay. plus this uh, silicon tetrachloride is also formed. Okay. Now, flow chart we see here same process the remaining uh, description of the process we discuss after uh, discussing the same through the flow chart. Okay. So, here what we are doing the silicon metals or whatever are there we are taking to some kind of ball mills which you might have studied in mechanical unit operations course otherwise this course is also available online in the MOOCs course uh, that I have done under the title of mechanical unit operations. So, here you can crush the uh, silicon metal to the desired size of the smaller size and then uh, you mix them with the copper and copper oxide catalyst and then take it to the methylating tower this is the reactor which is known as the methylating tower reactor right. So, this reactor is approximately operating at 250 to 300 degree centigrade right. So, now to this reactor uh, there is a jacket is also provided because this reaction is exothermic reaction right. So, through this uh, jacket you can uh, send the Dautem heat transfer fluid uh, both for it is done for the cooling as well as for the heating. Okay. So, when this uh, metal along with the catalyst interacts with the methyl chloride vapor that is coming from the bottom, so then what you get? You get mixed methyl chloro silence you get. 
okay. So, those mixed uh, methyl chloro silanes along with the unreacted silicon or you know methyl chloride etc may be there of course that you can take to a fractionating column, right. So, where uh, you know you can remove the impurities, vent gases etc and then uh, almost like pure uh, mixed methyl chloro silanes you can take to the storage with inert gas blanket as well, right. Now, then what you do? This mixture of uh, methyl chloro silanes, mixture in the sense whatever this Si, Cl, uh, Cl, Cl like these four bonds are there, some of them are you know chloro and then some of them are uh, uh, alkyl or aryl, right. So, now here it is methyl actually. So, if it is like you know 2 or uh, chloro, so then it is dimethyl dichloro silane. If it is 3 methyl and 1 chloro, then trimethyl chloro silane. If it is uh, 1 methyl and then uh, 3 chloro, uh, then it is methyl trichloro silane. So, it, all 3 are there, so that mixture is there, so all, all of them would be forming in fact. You cannot control the reaction conditions, contact time exactly in the industry as per the uh, theory, so that you can produce only desired product. You will also getting the other products also. And then this is, uh, we have already seen this replacement of Cl with the methyl uh, groups or any other alkyl groups is a series reaction, step by step se uh, series reaction. So, all of them would be forming. So, that mixture of uh, uh, methyl chloro silanes would be taken to series of distillation columns. In the first distillation column from the bottom high boiling components which are having boiling points more than 70 degree centigrades are taken as the residues whereas the low boiling components having you know less than 70 degree centigrades are taken to you know second uh, uh, distillation column where you know low boiling components which are having less than 57 degree centigrades of boiling point are taken as the top product and then remaining mixture is taken to the subsequent uh, distillation column. From the third column you get the tri methyl chloro silane as the top product, right. From the bottom what you have? You have the dimethyl dichloro as well as the methyl trichloro silane mixture that you take to the fourth column, right. So, from the top of the fourth column you get the methyl trichloro silane whereas from the bottom you get dimethyl dichloro silane, right. So, now until now what you have done? You have done, you prepared only monomers that is trimethyl chloro silane and then dimethyl dichloro silane monomers you prepared. Of course, you also got methyl trichloro silane which is not required for the polymerization. So, these trimethyl chloro silane and dimethyl uh, dichloro silanes are taken to hydrolysis reactors. This is one hydrolysis reactor, this is another hydrolysis reactor. Separately, these are taken to hydrolysis reactor where they are interacting with the water. So, that hydrolysis takes place and then you get the HCl from the bottom of the both reactors. Individually, they have been done. L let us say uh, hydrolysis of uh, dimethyl dichloro silane is done in the bottom reactor. Uh, bottom hydrolysis reactor, whereas the uh, hydrolysis of trimethyl chloro silane uh, has been done in the top hydrolysis reactor, right. So, from both the reactors HCl you get it as a bottom product. After removing that HCl, the material whatever is there, you know obviously HCl you are uh, separating out that means in the uh, monomer there would also be some HCl present. So, neutralization is done. So, the products of uh, these hydrolysis reactors are individually or separately neutralized in two neutralizers, where Na2CO3 is being added from the top to contact with the monomers so that they would be neutralized if at all any traces of HCl pr were present al along with them. So, after neutralization uh, with Na2CO3 in both of these neutralizers individually, their mixtures are taken to the filters, right, where if at all some salts are there, solid salts are there, they would be separated out and then neutralized uh, monomers are taken to polymerization reactor which is a continuous steel tank reactor to which H2SO4 catalyst is supplied from the top, 
okay? so that the polymerization takes place here. The temperature of polymerization is usually 100 to 200 degrees centigrade right? and then 3 to 4 uh, atmospheric gauge pressure. Okay? So, after the polymerization the mixture is taken to another neutralizer where again Na2CO3 is supplied. So, until this step whatever uh, purification and the neutralization filtering were there individual. Right? So, then so that you get the pure uh, monomers, those pure monomers are mixed in a polymerization reactor and then polymerization is taken place. After that neutralization is only single, there is nothing like a individual one. Right? So, here also neutralization is done with Na2CO3 to separate out if at all any traces of H2SO4 were there along with the silicon oils. Okay? So, those uh, H2SO4 traces should be separated out when uh, they interact with Na2CO3 in the form of Na2SO4 salts. Okay? That is done in filtration. In the filtration, Na2SO4 salts are separated and then silicon oil, silicon uh, liquids whatever are there or uh, polymers are there, they will be taken to a final fractionating column to separate out if at all any light oils are there. Because this oil, silicon oils since they are non-volatile and then highly stable with uh, against the temperature obviously they would be uh, heavier products and then such heavier products are collected from the bottom as silicon oils. Okay? So, this is the flow chart. So, in this uh, uh, flow chart we have seen all the details of the process about the description up to this part of uh, you know methylating tower to get the mixed methyl chlorosilanes we have discussed remaining steps we are discussing now here in the text form though the same thing we have discussed in the flow chart the dowdham also serves as a coolant not only for the heat transfer uh, fluid it is also used as a coolant that is the good thing about such kind of fluids and Heat is further controlled by rate of methyl chloride addition and then pressure is usually 1 to 2 atmosphere in the methylating tower reactor. Overhead gas product is fed to a fractionator where unreacted methyl chloride is stripped off for a recycle though it is not shown in the uh, flow chart but that is in general followed. Then silanes are stored in air and moisture free conditions for distillation column feeds. Four columns are used to split out dimethyl and trimethyl chlorosilanes from side products. These two monomers are hydrolyzed separately to siloxane oils and an aqueous HCl layer which drawn off the bottom. Neutralized siloxanes are combined in the correct proportions in a batch polymerizer with H2SO4 as the catalyst conditions. Temperature usually 100 to 200 degree centigrade for 2 to 3 hours. And then neutralization with Na2CO3 and filtration to remove Na2SO4 yields a clear oil which can be rid of light ends by steam stripping as we have seen in the flow chart. Major engineering problems of this process. Unusual engineering features include maintenance of anhydrous conditions in the formation of monomer that is one important thing. Then hydrolysis units must cope with corrosive wet HCl because that is being produced and that has to be separated out. Therefore, glass lined equipment are used for this hydrolysis purpose. Monomers are volatile, flammable and often explosive if oxygen is present and toxic. So, you have to make sure that oxygen free atmosphere that is the reason you know this uh, mixed uh, methyl monomers or mixed methyl uh, silanes are you know stored in the presence of uh, inert gas blankets as shown in the flow chart. So, that is all about uh, silicons or silicon oil or silicon polymers production process. right? So, now before concluding the lecture we have a few basics about uh, Indian uh, rubber industry. Indian rubber industry may be broadly divided into three categories. First one is well organized auto tire units, second one is medium scale units, third one is small units and tiny sector. Under the well organized auto tire units mostly whatever uh, elastomers are there 50 percent are being consumed for this uh, well organized auto tire units. 
and then 25 percent of uh, elastomer is being consumed for uh, medium scale units whereas the small units and tiny sectors accounting for balanced 25 percent consumption of uh, elastomer polymers or rubbers. Okay? So, however, uh, though these units are small units and consuming only 25 percent, they are the backbone of Indian rubber industry because there are about more than 5000 manufacturing units are there and they are spread all over the India. Prediction of uh, use of natural versus synthetic rubber in India if you see, in 1995 whatever the rubber needs of India were there, 80 percent of them were fulfilled by the natural rubbers whereas remaining 20 percent only by synthetic rubber. By 2000 natural rubber contribution decreased to 25 percent whereas synthetic rubber uh, contribution to fulfill the Indian rubber needs increased to 25 percent. 2005 these numbers changed to 72 percent and 28 percent respectively for natural rubber and synthetic rubber and by 2010 almost 70 percent of uh, uh, Indian rubber needs were fulfilled by the natural rubbers whereas the 30 percent are being fulfilled by the synthetic rubbers. Even the recent years also these numbers have not changed much significantly that indicates that still for Indian uh, uh, rubber needs natural rubber is a primary source. In western world synthetic rubber is more produced due to the following reasons that is availability of low cost hydrocarbon raw materials and it is combined with relative unavailability of a natural rubber due to large labor requirements and relative undesirable climate because of uh, these three reasons that is uh, availability of low cost uh, hydrocarbon raw materials and then relative unavailability of natural rubber and then relative undesirable climate conditions of uh, foreign conditions. Natural rubber contribution is not much there whereas the synthetic rubber contribution is more to fulfill their rubber needs. Position of natural rubber in India is unique. In India desirable climate and then land availability combined with availability of low cost labor to produce an attractive supply of natural rubber. In India among the plantation crops natural rubber was maintained one of the fastest growth uh, rates, vigorous in nature and vibrant in character as well. India obtained its bulk requirements of natural rubber from domestic sources. Competition from synthetic rubber to natural rubber is practically non-existent in India and economically also insignificant. Thus natural rubber seen in India is entirely different from that obtaining in other producing countries. Rubber goods manufacturing industry in India has done remarkably well. Leading rubber producing state in India is Kerala accounting for nearly 25 percent of annual rubber production and the area under its cultivation. Northeastern states particularly Tripura, Assam and Meghalaya are emerging as major rubber producing states for India. India is the fourth largest producer of natural rubber accounting for about uh, 6 percent of uh, global output. Synthetic rubber supplements, natural rubber in tires for two wheelers and other automobiles only. Indian rubber industry is of great importance to national economy because of such reasons because most of the rubber requirements are fulfilled by the uh, natural rubbers. This industry is servicing the precision requirements of defense, transportation sector, railway transport systems, air services, mechanical requirements and then consumer requirements. So, almost all sectors whatever the rubber requirements are there that are being fulfilled by the you know natural rubber produced by the Indian rubber industry. Major items produced are tires, tubes, belts, horses, rubber footwear, waterproof fabrics, etc. As the products are of 
vastly different nature, the industry can be broadly classified into tyre and non-tyre sectors. Non-tyre sector is mostly dominated by small scale and medium sized units. Indian rubber goods industry is the third largest contributor to nation's economy. Okay? That is the reason we were discussing about the rubber industry separately as a separate chapter. Tire sector is essentially a processing industry with raw materials accounting for about 70 percent of production cost. Raw materials used in manufacture of tires in India includes different types of raw materials are used other than the natural rubber. They include nylon tire cord 36 percent of raw materials cost in uh, value terms, then natural rubber 25 percent, carbon black 16 percent, synthetic rubber 11 percent, rubber chemicals 12 percent. All of these raw materials are indigenous for India. However, you know their cost is almost uh, 50 to 100 percent higher than that available uh, from the world markets. Also whatever we get from the world markets their purity is better. Okay? But however, importing such raw materials attract an average duty of 65 percent, you know that is quite high. That is the reason we depend on our own indigenous raw materials listed below, listed above here. Profile of raw material consumption is 22 to 78 ratio of synthetic and natural rubbers. Consumption in Indian tyres whereas it is 64 to 36 abroad. So, you can see almost reverse. So, in Indian uh, rubber industry for the tyres especially you know most of the natural rubber is supplying the uh, demand whereas in the foreign synthetic rubber is supplying the demand of uh, you know their rubbers. This difference in use of natural and synthetic rubbers in India and abroad are due to larger production of truck tyres in India and natural rubber is preferred choice for truck tyres by virtue of being cheaper and more rugged. All raw materials required for automobile tyres and tubes are indigenous as already mentioned. However, for manufacture of uh, radial tyres the unit may also have to import special steel cord fabric from abroad. Okay. Finally, compounding ingredients for the elastomers would be discussed before concluding the lecture. Essential aspect of production of a finished part from any elastomer is the addition of compounding ingredients. That is what we have seen, uh, additives, fillers, plasticizers, uh, antioxidants, etc. are being added to the basic elastomers. Then only final products would be in the usable conditions. Otherwise, you know uh, uh, pure elastomer is as useless as pure gold. Pure gold is useless because until and unless you dilute with the other metal like copper, it cannot get, gain the strength to make uh, ornaments etc. Right? Likewise, elastomers also if you are not using compounding ingredients, it is as useless as pure gold. Okay? It is true for all types of uh, natural rubber or SBR or silicon rubbers. These are so much important that without these ingredients it is believed synonymously that pure rubber is as useless as pure gold. Desirable properties of uh, rubber goods are achieved by art of rubber compounds. Some of the important properties of uh, rubber goods which are you know achieved by art of uh, rubber compounding by ingredients or after adding ingredients, necessary ingredients, whatever the rubber goods that you get, their properties if you see they include plasticity, elasticity, hardness, softness, abrasion resistance, impermeability as well. Most important compounding ingredient is carbon black. In almost all tyres and tubes manufacturing this carbon black is used. It is used to improve wearing qualities of both natural and then synthetic SBR by imparting toughness. For that purpose this carbon black, carbon black compounding ingredient is used. Okay. References for today's lecture are provided here. Outlines of chemical technology 
by Dryden, edited and revised by Gopal Rao and Marshall, third edition. Then Chemical Process Industries by Austin and Shreve. Then Encyclopedia of Chemical Technology by Kirk and Atmar, fourth edition. And Unit Processes in Organic Synthesis by Groggins, fifth edition. Thank you. With this, uh, we complete our uh, organic chemical technology MOOCs course. I hope you must have enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much for your attention and all the best.